Hey everybody, it's your life science slash biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are starting our 10th unit in the class, which is on the introduction to ecology. And our first learning target and our topic that we're going to get into today is energy flow in ecosystems. There's a lot to unpack here. We got to figure out what an ecosystem is first before we even begin to talk about how energy flows through one. So we got a lot to do and I'm going to get started right away. So as I always, I'd like to start these off with a couple of questions. Here's the first one. The bald eagle nearly went extinct in the 1970s because of an insecticide. How is that possible? That's right, America's symbol of freedom, our national bird, nearly went extinct. And it was our own fault, and it was due to an insecticide, if you can believe it. So how do you think that that was possible? Let me know your thoughts. Um, and second question is that the jaguar... Um, the jaguars are considered to be the most important species in South American rainforest. So the Amazon, one of the most biodiverse areas and the most important ecological areas in the entire world, the jaguar is supposed to be the number one, one of the most important species in the entire ecosystem. Why is that? Let me know what you think, and we'll talk about it at the end of the video. All right, so here's the basic rule of ecology. All living things need specific resources and conditions from their environment to survive. If you're a living thing, you not only need to require on your environment to survive, you also need to rely on other living things to survive. And the branch of biology, what we're getting into in this unit, that deals with that and the relations of organisms to each other in their environment is ecology. So how does an organism interact with not only its environment, but the other organisms in its environment? Um, and that's what we're doing. We're studying ecology. And what we're going to study today specifically are, is how energy flows through an ecosystem because every living thing needs to have energy. Okay? So ecologists, one of the things that they study is an ecosystem. And let's be clear here. An ecosystem is not just the living things in an environment. It's also the non-living things. So it's all of the biotic, the living things, and the abiotic components in a given area. That's right. Take a look. It's our carbon cycle. If you were in my class for unit two, unit three, I think this was, um, we discussed the carbon cycle at length. We talked about photosynthesis, cellular respiration, decomposition, combustion, and consumption, um, and how carbon is passed from one part of an ecosystem to another. It can go from the air to the ground to plants to animals. It can get burned. It can get buried, all sorts of different places. Energy and matter flow and cycle through ecosystems. So energy flows and matter cycles through ecosystems. As we learned in a previous unit here, matter cycles, but carbon isn't energy. Energy has to flow through an ecosystem. Okay, but before we get into that, let's define some other terms here that'll help us um, with our understanding of ecology for the rest of this unit. Um, so ecologists don't just study ecosystems. They can study it at different scales. Um, they can study a population, which is a group of the, an organism of the same species that lives in the same area. You've heard me say this word a lot um, if you've been paying attention in class, um, but this is our formal definition of it. So here, check it out. It's a population of alligators. You could have a population of sardines. You could have a population of termites. You could have a population of protozoans. All right, as long as they're the same species living in the same area, it's a population. Okay, so if I were to take multiple populations and put them all in the same space and study those, I would be studying what's called a community, which is multiple populations of different species. Okay, so if all these species are living in a wetland and I'm studying them all um, collectively, so like these gators and these turtles and these ibises and stuff, that would be studying a wetland community. Okay, and then an ecosystem, as we de defined before, would be if I'm studying all the all those communities or that entire community, all those populations together, and how they interact with their non-living things in their environment, then I would be studying the ecosystem. So one level above the ecosystem is what we call the biome, um, which is a regional or global distribution of organisms adapted to a particular environment. So an example for a biome would be a desert, a tropical rainforest, a tundra, um, that would be a biome. It's multiple ecosystems that are combined together. Um, so ecosystem plus ecosystem kind of makes a biome. Um, and we can study those different types of biomes. And here's a Earth's biomes map over here. Um, so in my part of the world, I think this would be temperate forest, but I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, so there you go. Those are some terms that we're going to come back to throughout this unit um, talking about ecology. 
So uh, as we were, I was bringing up before, we know that matter cycles is that carbon and oxygen and all sorts of different other nutrients and waste get passed from one thing to the next um, in a ecosystem and it gets cycled over and over again for infinity. Um, but how does energy flow through ecosystems? And it seems like a more complicated idea than it actually is because how does energy flow through ecosystems? Well, things eat each other. You know, uh, I mean, it's a, that's really simple, but you get the idea. Things eat each other. A food chain is a sequence that links species by feeding relationships, and it models an energy flow in an ecosystem. So every living thing, of course, you need energy in order to, you know, stay alive or even be considered alive. And where does that energy come from? It's, first of all, it comes from your environment, and it comes from other living things, right? And what better model to show how energy flows through an ecosystem than a food chain? Okay, and uh, always at the bottom of the food chain are what we call producers. Producers obtain energy from non-living sources and consumers obtain energy from other organisms, right? So we're com coming back to those two topics from uh, earlier this year too. A producer makes their own energy um, or gets energy from non-living sources in their environment. Um, but consumers have to eat other things. You and I have to eat other organisms or, the, or um, things made of other organisms in order to survive. Okay, whether that's plants or animals. All right, so we're going to be studying food chains. Um, so the parts of a food chain are known as what we call trophic levels, and that is a term that I'm going to um, ask you to know if you're in my class. Um, and energy flows from a bottom trophic level to the top. Okay, so uh, energy flows from this producer to the, what we call the primary consumer, the first consumer, um, because the primary consumer eats the producer. And then guess what? The secondary consumer gets energy from the primary consumer because the secondary consumer eats the primary consumer. But notice that the arrow isn't going from the secondary consumer to the primary consumer because, oh, well, the secondary consumer eats it. But it's getting energy from, the secondary consumer is getting energy from the primary consumer. So we draw the arrow going from the primary to the secondary consumer. And guess what? The tertiary means third um, that's going to be eating the secondary consumer, and that means that energy is going from the secondary consumer to the tertiary consumer. And if we were to take it another step further, we would be talking about the quaternary consumer, which would be fourth. Okay, um, so it can uh, it can keep going, but only up to an extent. A perhaps even more um, representative diagram of how energy flows in an ecosystem is not just through a food chain, because there's more than one type of primary consumer or secondary consumer or producer that's in a real live ecosystem. So a food web, which is a complex network of feeding relationships between trophic levels, might more closely represent energy flow in an ecosystem rather than just one thing going to the next, to the next, to the next, right? Because we have lots of different varieties of living things um, in our ecosystems, right? We have a lot of biodiversity. So this food web over here, this wetland food web, might be a little more representative of the actual energy flow rather than just a food chain. Okay, so here's, a, here's another question for everybody here. Uh, what do you think? So this is showing how energy goes from produ con produ bleh, excuse me, producers to consumers to you know, primary, secondary consumers. Okay, but what if I got rid of one of the species in my ecosystem over here? What would happen if I removed the population of great blue herons from the food web? Okay, and if this food web is accurate, we can make several predictions. Uh, based on what would happen if I got rid of these blue herons. So go ahead, give it a shot here if you haven't yet. How would this population be affected if we remove the great blue herons from it? Take a guess. Okay. Um, so here's the thing about this, though. Hmm. Are there always bigger fish in a in a food web? Right. There's there's always going to be um, some arrows going from one place to the next, showing energy flow. But is there always a bigger fish? Um, meaning that is there always going to be something that's going to, is that trophic level just going to keep going and going and going? Is that food chain going to continue on forever? Um, you probably know the answer is it, no, it's not. It's because energy at each trophic level is lost as heat or used for growth or for biomass, so available energy decreases at higher levels. And this is going to make more sense here in just a second, but essentially whatever you eat, right, Whatever you eat, you're going to use for your own energy, and you're going to use for your own metabolism. Therefore, if you get eaten, you know, whatever eats you isn't going to get all the energy from what you ate because you're a living thing and you're going to need that energy, right? 
So here's an energy pyramid. This is another really, really great way to depict energy flow in an ecosystem, not only because it shows like a food chain, but it also shows relative amounts of energy at each level. Okay, so here's our, here's our primary producers, here's our primary consumers, here's our secondary consumers, here's our tertiary consumers, and we have a different kind of food web going on here. Um, and at the very, very bottom is our decomposers, which will break down any dead or decaying um, organisms that, uh, you know, didn't quite make it, right? Um, so here's the thing. Why do we use a pyramid to represent energy flow in an ecosystem? Well, a pyramid, it starts really wide at the bottom and it gets more narrow at the top. And that's actually representative of energy availability at each trophic level in an ecosystem. Less energy, less biomass, and fewer organisms at higher levels. Because if you think about this for a second, when have you been out in nature? Maybe you're in a state park, you're out on a walk or something like that, and you just see tons and tons of foxes out in the forest, but then you don't see hardly any squirrels. Is there any ecosystem that's going to be like that, any natural ecosystem? And the answer is no, because less energy is available to the foxes in an ecosystem than there is to, say, the squirrels or much less the trees. You're going to see far more trees than you are going to see foxes or snakes um, in a forest, simply because there's more energy available at these lower um, levels. And in fact, we can use a rule called the 10% rule um, to demonstrate how energy flows within an ecosystem. Energy flow in ecosystems follows a 10% rule. Only 10% of energy at one trophic level is passed to the next. 90% of the energy at each level is lost as heat or is used by those um, organisms. Okay, so we can use a rule of 10 or we can just chop off some zeros here and we can, um, we can make an accurate depiction of energy flow. So check it out. If I have, if 100% of an ecosystem's energy, let's just say um, from the sun, is gathered by my primary pr producers, my primary consumers only receive 10% of that energy. Okay, then the secondary consumers that eat the primary consumers only get 10% of that amount of energy. So they only get really 1% of what the primary producers make. Okay? And if we keep going here, it divides by 10 every single time. Every single time uh, we, we, well, reduce, we reduce our energy by 90%. We go from 1% to 0.1%, and then we go to 0.01%. So there's not much energy availability at what we might call the apex predators trophic level, okay? And how many apex predators do you see relative to, say, primary consumers or primary producers? Not that many. Why? Because there's less energy available to them. Okay, so let's uh, put, this in, put this into practice here. If producers contain, obtain 15,000 kilojoules, and that's a unit of energy, of energy, um, how much do secondary consumers obtain? So see if you can't work this out by yourself, and then I'm going to go through the answer. Okay, so if they, uh, the producer's got 15,000 kilojoules, well, we divide by 10 for each level up. We've got to go one, two levels up, so we're going to divide by 10 twice. So 15,000 divided by 10 ends up being 1,500. But then since we're going to the secondary consumers, we have to divide it in 10 again, and that means 150 kilojoules of energy are available for the secondary consumers if 15,000 are available to the primary consumer, or excuse me, primary producers. Okay, so that's what we call the 10% rule. So now let's try this. If primary consumers obtain 100,000 kilojoules of energy, how much do the quaternary or apex consumers can obtain? Try this out for yourself. Use your 10% rule, and I'm going to go over it in just a second. Okay, here we go. So if we're going one, two, three levels up, that means we're going to divide by 10 three times. So 100,000 divided by 10 is 10,000, 10,000 divided by 10 is 1,000, and 1,000 divided by 10 is 100 kilojoules. Um, so 100,000 kilojoules are available for the primary consumers, 100 are only available for apex predators. So the higher you go in that pyramid, the less energy there is, and that's why we can't go on forever. Okay, so to wrap up this, uh, wrap up this video here, let's come back to our bald eagle. Why did the bald eagle almost go extinct? How is that even possible? Well, it's because of a process, just like what we were seeing before, bald eagles are quaternary consumers. They are apex predators, right? Um, so as, if we follow where a bald eagle gets its energy from in a food web, 
Well, guess what? This food ingested large amounts of DDT, which was a pesticide that was used um, and ended up in rivers. So their foods, 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 food ended up ingesting a lot of this DDT and biomagnification occurred. So a lot of this DDT, a lot of this pesticide based on what the bald eagles were eating would end up inside the bald eagles themselves and would essentially poison them. And what would happen is the bald eagles would lay their eggs, but the, the chemical, this insecticide called DDT, would reduce the, um, the hardness of their eggs so their eggs would be all soft and not be able to support their young. Um, and bald eagle populations went way down as a result of it. But of course, DDT was banned and bald eagles are doing okay today. So yay, happy environmental story. All right. Um, so the second question that I wanted to ask you was jaguars are the most important species in South American rainforest. Why do you think that is? Um, and here we go. Let's talk about it. Same kind of thing. Jaguars are apex predators. Their population regulates the growth of all the others that it eats and in turn what its prey eats as well. Okay. So coming back to this food web here, if we got rid of this, this great blue heron, how would it affect the, uh, the shad populations? and thus how would it affect the Daphnia populations? How might it affect the, um, the sunfish populations? Okay, um, Jaguars are at the top, 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 tippity top of the food web in the Amazon rainforest, and they're super important for regulating all of and controlling the population growth, of all the everything else below it in the food web. Okay, um, that is it for this video. We're going to get into population ecology in our next video. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you next time.